This morning we are going to be in Acts chapter 9, returning to our pre-summer series after a pretty long hiatus off of it. I told you guys last week that we were going to be back on schedule for our preaching calendar, and that's going to last all of one week, because after today we're going to be off again. So I will preempt that by saying we will probably type up a new preaching calendar and get that back out to you guys in the next couple of weeks because I realized this week when I was preparing Acts chapter 9 that it's a really long chapter. And we only allotted one week for Acts chapter 9. And in order for me to get to Acts, to complete Acts chapter 9, I'd have to preach through lunch. And uh, I like dessert too much to do that, so um, we're just not going to do that this morning. So this morning we, we are just going to do part of Acts chapter 9 and we will readjust the calendar to accompany and to deal with that as, as we see fit. And we'll, we'll get back to you guys on how we're going to complete the year <clears throat> after we figure that out. But this morning we come to a passage and I'm excited to be back in Acts. Acts is, is one of my favorite books of the Bible um, along with Genesis, Matthew, Hebrews and uh, well pretty much a few others. But because it has a lot to teach us. It has a lot to teach us on how to live in the church, how to, how to function as a people. Uh, remember when we, were, when we were talking originally back in Acts, is, Acts is Jesus is working in the church. Uh, a lot of people would term that Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. Well, that's not necessarily a false representation of the book of Acts, but I think Acts more accurately depicts is how Jesus is at work in the life of the church. Jesus working through the Apostles more so than the Acts of the Apostles. It's more of Jesus working through and in the Apostles and through and in the church than anything else. And we're going to see that distinctly again here in Acts chapter 9, how Jesus is the hero of this story. Jesus is the hero of our lives. Jesus is the hero here in Bookcliff. Uh, Jesus is the hero in every one of us who calls ourselves one of the redeemed, one of the way, one of the followers of Jesus. And so this morning, we pick up in Acts chapter 9, Beginning in verse 1, and it says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And there, for three days, he was without sight, and neither ate or drank. And there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord... I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and to the children of Israel. Look at verse 16 before we, before we pass over it. Verse 16, this is, this is God speaking to Ananias. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. So we open Acts chapter 9, it says, But Saul, the events in Acts 7, the stoning of uh, of Stephen, led to the scattering of new believers who gathered in Jerusalem. The event was a great encouragement for those who had come to celebrate Pentecost. 
and then received the Holy Spirit to return to their homelands. We specifically followed the story of one of the deacons named Philip who himself was propelled into Samaria by the persecution of Christians led by a guy named Saul. He was the leader of all of this. He was the ringleader. While in Samaria, we remember that Philip was brought by God to bring redemption to a people who had been outcasts, the unclean. We saw this in chapter 7 and chapter 8, a cut off people from the Israelites. But God in his sovereignty brought Philip to the people of Samaria and many people were redeemed. The outcast believed. The outcasts were brought into the fold. After Samaria, God sent Philip to the desert to encounter an Ethiopian eunuch who was traveling, searching for truth and searching for God. It was again by God's divine sovereignty that the eunuch is searching. Why is it that this would happen? It is by God's sovereignty that Philip ends up in the desert. Remember, we see at the end of Samaria that he is taken and that he ends up in the desert at just the right time to encounter a caravan of Ethiopians with his official from the court of Candace in tow. It was there that God, by the power of his spirit and the obedience of Philip in sharing the gospel that the Ethiopian believed and was baptized. We see in Acts where God is about the business of being actively involved in the lives of his people. Many, possibly even many of us in this room, would like to think that God is some divine clockmaker who made the clock, shows up every now and then, and winds the clock to keep it going. I don't know how many of you have these older clocks. My grandfather, um, who was a doctor, liked to collect clocks and from his grandfather to his grandfather passed down all of these old clocks. So we have a clock in my parents' house now that's over 300 years old now. Believe it or not, it still works. My dad had it restored in Houston uh, this past year. And so at least once a day, my dad goes around the house sticking the keys in the clock and winding them opposite directions. And you have to do it just right or the clock... You have to go back and send it back to the clock maker and make it work again. So every day, and then my kids, when we visited just at the beginning of August, you, you're, the kids are upstairs taking a nap, and what happens? The whole house starts ringing. You know what I'm saying? Like, can you take a nap? Like, it, but the whole house starts dinging, and, and one is just a little bit later than the other one. And so it's dinging here, and it's dinging here, and it's dinging. Like, what, what, okay. But you see the history of, but anyway, but so a lot of people think that perhaps God is just this divine clockmaker who just shows up every now and then, sticks the keys in the clock and turns it so that the sun keeps coming and so that the earth keeps spinning. But when we read and as we track through this story of Acts, we know that that's absolutely not the case. We, we see that God is not a God who is watching from afar, but a God who is actively, the key word here is actively involved in the lives of his people. He came down to earth to live among his people in human form for the purpose of teaching about the kingdom and to feel, fulfill the promise of redemption that is available to all whom he calls. After Jesus' death, we must remember that God didn't disassociate himself from us. He didn't leave us to our own devices and to our detriment. But yet again, he sent his spirit. We are reminded in John time and time again where he says he's going to send us a better helper. Matthew 28, one of these verses that I keep bringing. He is with us even to the end. He's speaking of the church. He sent his spirit to dwell within each and every one of his people. And we have seen all throughout the book of Acts that is the spirit of God at work in the people of God to bring about the narrative of redemption. For it is when God manifests himself in each and every one of us that we are no longer captives of this world, but we are set free. Right? Isn't that what we're singing about this morning? We are free. We don't belong to one people. We don't belong to one nation. We don't belong to one segment. We don't belong to one state, one city. We don't, we look at at what's happening in our world and we need to remind those around, we are free. And we call those around us to be free because we are part of the kingdom. And we, we denounce the problems of this world and we denounce it boldly because we are a people of God. We are a kingdom of God. And so we can boldly decry the things happening in our world and decry it by the name of the gospel. 
Not a flag, not a, a constitution, not any other civil rights movement or anything, but we decry it by the gospel because the gospel says that we are God's people. He created us in His image. In the image of God, we are His people. He redeems us and He manifests in us. We are the only thing on the planet who are created in His image. And we see this in the book of Acts, that He is intrinsic, intrinsic, in, He is interested <laughs> at works. He is interested in each and every facet of our lives. He's not disassociated. And as we look in this passage in Acts chapter 9, nothing's changing. He's not stepping back and looking at it from afar, but he is involved in what's happening. He is working about the redemption in this life of this man named Saul. Now, most of us in this day and age would consider Saul a terrorist, right? We would look at him and say, well, he could be part of ISIS or he could be part of any one of the, the known terrorist groups that are on the watch list. And he would say, we want to stay away from this man. He is part of somebody that we would not want to bring into the door of the church because we know that he's gotten a decree from the chief priest to arrest and bring back to Jerusalem any of those who are part of the way. And so we wouldn't want him coming in the building because we would by nature be afraid of this man. And it would be justified. Because the church has been afraid, we will have seen him at the stoning of Stephen giving approval to it. We will have seen this over and over again, but we don't have God's Perspective. Remember, we see this in our perspective. We see the timeline right here. We see our lives. This is our zero to 70 or zero to 90 or zero to 100 years. And our timeline is about this big. Our, our view of things is about this big. And God's looking at the whole perspective of the world. And he sees it from beginning to end just by looking down. Eternity past, eternity future, he looks down and he sees the whole picture. And the same way where we keep talking about in the book of Genesis, when we tell our child, you don't want to ride your bike out in, in the road in front of a car because it's, it's dangerous. And the child looks back and says, why? But the road is the best place to ride it because there's less bumps in the road. And you say, it's dangerous. And the child gets mad at you. Why? Because you have the right perspective. God has the right perspective even when our perspective is limited. He has the perspective. So God is working the redemption of, this, of the life of this man named Saul who was a vicious persecutor of the Christians. We met Saul in Acts 7 when he was witnessing and giving approval to the mobs. In Acts 8 where Saul himself is leading the charge in Jerusalem, dragging believers into the streets and throwing many in jail, killing some, attempting to force them to recant the gospel. It is this man who we will devote our time to this morning and seeing how he plays into the story of redemption. In Acts chapter 9 verse 1 it says Paul or Saul is still breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest, asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if any were found belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul was angry Saul was a hunter of those claiming to be followers of this man named Jesus. Saul had been raised to know the law. Saul had righteous anger. He had the right to be angry. Think about this for a moment. Everything that Saul had been taught pointed to the fact that this man Jesus was a false prophet. And to make matters worse, the law teaches that cursed is every man who hangs on the tree. Deuteronomy chapter 21. By all accounts, in Saul's mind, by all accounts, Jesus was a fraud. Okay, follow with me here. By all accounts to Saul, Jesus was a fraud and it was completely unacceptable that people were going about teaching freedom from the law and performing miracles in the name of Jesus. This had to be stopped. Saul had to defend the temple. Saul had to defend the truth and he would go to any length necessary. Saul was living off of his own self-righteousness. Saul was born the son of a Pharisee and the son of a Roman citizen. Saul sat under the teaching of the great Gamaliel and by all accounts, Saul Saul was in line to be the next great leader of the temple. Saul was the hope for the Jewish nation. In many accounts, he represented hope. 
right? He represented that for the Jewish nation. He represented courage and vitality for a temple that was growing faint and waiting for the coming Messiah. Saul was representing righteousness, something the Sanhedrin and the priests and the Pharisees had lost in their pursuit of power and in their claim for position. Saul was goal, his purpose here, was about bringing back honor and eliminating false teaching. No longer did he want to be limited to just arresting and persecuting new believers in Jerusalem. He wanted to spread out. He wanted his power and authority to travel throughout the country and, and all the lands inhabited by the Jews to prevent further spreading of false teaching. This was an honorable thing, right? Look at this. This is honorable. He wants to stop false teaching. This is something that we can look at and say, okay, it's not as bad as it seems. Saul wants to go to these other cities. He needs just more than his own authority. He needs authority from the temple. He needs validation for what he is doing. He wants to go with the endorsement of the high priest so that nothing can stop him. Saul is a hunter. And now he has an open season hunting pass on all the followers of the way, the new believers. We see in verse 3, now he's on his way. He approaches Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shines or shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him in verse 4, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, Saul's response, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. Who you are persecuting. Catch this. The hunter becomes the hunted. The great hunter himself is brought down. The light was so great that Saul is riding on his horse on the way to Damascus that he is not to the ground. Do you notice the words here? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Jesus whom Saul, only Saul as a false prophet, whom had been crucified on the cross, who had died, who had all these followers, was addressing the great adversary. Follow with me here. This one instance would call into question everything Saul believed in, his whole motives in going, everything he did. The fact that Jesus is alive changes everything. He is real. He is the Messiah. Saul is wrong. The temple is wrong. The persecution is unjust. Saul has devoted himself to stop the followers of Jesus. And now Jesus is talking to Saul in the form of a great light. There could be no more radical conversion experience for a man who is an avid destroyer of the way himself to be addressed by God than in this instance. Now, let us not just breeze over this moment. Here's a man who is breathing murderous threats against the church, a man who is desiring to stop the message of the gospel. And in this moment, God himself, who is actively involved in the lives of his people, intervenes, and in the method he chooses is light. Notice this. God could have started an earthquake, cracked the earth open, created a great chasm there, and Saul would have been here, and Damascus would have been there, and he could have just stood there and talked to him. God could have killed the horse off dead right there. Now, I'm not advocating harming animals here, but he could have stopped the horse dead. Saul could have been sitting there like, what happened? Any other methods God, God could have picked Saul up had him hanging in the sky there and really created a scene. You know what I'm saying? God uses light. This isn't a small thing. In Genesis chapter 1, let's look at other instances where God uses light. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 3, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. Look at this phrase right here. God separated the light from the darkness. 
Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2. The people who walked in the darkness have seen the great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. This is the message of Jesus here. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it in a basket. In the same way, verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. John chapter 12, verses 35. He says, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have light, lest the darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. God could have used any method to get Saul's attention, but there is no small reason in which he used light. For light demonstrates that Saul is in the presence of God, and more than anything else, light demonstrates that in this moment, in this instance, God is involved and he reaches down and he pulls back the darkness. He pulls back the darkness and he shines the light into Saul's life. This is the message of the gospel. This is where we see God actively involved in the life of his people. Because if there's one thing that's true about this world, if there's one thing that's true about our lives, is that this world is darkness. We see this in scripture, that people love darkness. People dwell in darkness. This world is a world of darkness. It happens since Genesis 3. It's carried forward. The message of redemption is that God is bringing about restoration where there will be no more darkness. We see that in Revelation chapter 21. There will be no more pain. There will be no more tears. And here in this moment, we see that God is actively involved. He pulls back the darkness and he shines the light in the life of Saul. He peels it back and says, Here I am, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Could there be a more vivid illustration? I am the light of the world. It's not a small thing. When God transforms our life, it's the same thing that happens. God peels back the darkness and says, I am the light of the world. No matter your conversion experience, if you, as we were spending time with these people who are becoming members and, and trying to track their conversion stories, and, and no matter if we grew up in church and we've, just, and we've heard the gospel so many times that we can't pinpoint the actual point of conversion, which is okay, or if we had one of those radical conversion moments because we, just, we, had, we weren't graced, by, by being protected for all of our lives, there's always a moment when God pulls back the darkness in our lives and he says, this is who I am. You are mine and you do not belong in the darkness, but you belong in the light and I, you are mine and I am yours and you will be in the light. Now notice this though. We, we've seen the conversion of Philip. We've seen the conversion of the people in Samaria. And we're going to see the conversion of Cornelius coming up. And every one of them is different. But the one thing that they're all marked by is God is involved. And in every one of them we see the light of God is in them. And the one thing that is true about this conversion moment is that Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 is that you become the light of the world. And it's not something that we can just kind of cover back up. Because when we cover that back, back, back up is that we become darkness. And that's not true anymore. Because we are inhabited by Him, we become reflections of Him. And if God is in us, we don't stop reflecting Him because the light keeps coming. And if our eyes are on Him and He is in us, we don't cut off the reflection. It keeps happening. It keeps going and we see that actively in us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we talked about this a few weeks ago. It says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. On those days where you wonder where God is, on those days where you're just struggling, know this verse. Memorize this verse. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Know it. Write it on your heart because you are a people 
Saul was the, we look at Saul's testimony, what, what Forrest read in 1 Timothy, he knew that he was a vile sinner saved by the grace of God for the message and the work of God. We are a chosen race, a people for his possession, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him. Continuing on in Acts chapter 9, verse 6, and, and, and God speaks, as continue to speak to Saul here, says, Rise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless. They're hearing the voice and seeing no one. Saul rose from their ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate or drank. And the entourage that's with Saul happened to hear the voice but didn't understand. Here, their great and mighty leader falling on the ground in front of them, speaking to a voice from heaven. And now he gets up with the great and mighty leader and is anything but great and mighty. He cannot even guide himself for he's blind. The, the great leader, the future hope of the temple is not so great and mighty anymore. The great leader of the church, the defender of the faith is now nothing more than a poor blind man who can't even guide himself. This is also an accurate representation of what it means that we are humbled to ourselves because we are no longer the king of our life. The blindness represents so much of Saul's life. For the first time ever, he realizes that this physical blindness has represented the state of his soul and spirit the whole time. While he may not be able to see right now, he is realizing that he has been blinded spiritually his whole life. Now for a moment this morning, can we honestly evaluate our own lives in this room where there's more than 100 people present? We cannot presume that everyone in this room is redeemed, even those who have been in this church longer than I have been alive. We must remember, we must remember that Saul was one of the faithful. Saul was a defender, not just a defender, but a staunch defender of the faith. He had the words of God memorized. In this room this morning, are there any of us willing to humbly submit to God, recognizing that our lips are not matching our hearts and our souls, that what we attempt to proclaim is not the true desire and action of our heart, that what we're reflecting is not from God, but rather from some other self-ambition? D.G. D. Peterson points out, Saul did not find a new God to worship here. He discovered that he had been in rebellion against the God of Abraham. He had been in rebellion against the God of Isaac and Jacob by refusing to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah. His persecution of the Lord's disciples by which he sought to destroy the church meant that he was actively, he was actively, Saul was actively opposing God's saving purpose for Israel and his saving purpose of the nation's. Now, for us, while in reality he did not find a new God to worship, he did have to submit and re recognize that he was not the God of his own life anymore. So he had to get off of his own throne. The question for you and I this morning, is this where we are? Is this the moment where we must look beyond our musical preferences, our stylistic preferences, the decoration or whatever, and must realize that perhaps that is pointing to a greater question. Who is it or what is it that we worship? What is sitting on the throne of our lives this morning? What is it that is occupying the kingdom spot where God is king. Because God has brought us here for a greater purpose. It's to know him and to make him known. To worship him and to see him glorified. To love him. To have his heart. To have his eyes. To see him high and lifted up. To see us more humble. To see us more lowly. To see him more exalted. To set our eyes fully on him. In Acts chapter 9, the great leader is brought to Damascus. Notice this, where he waits the great leader of the temple doesn't enter into Damascus into pomp and circumstance anymore, but he enters into Damascus where he waits. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Now, before we even get to this, 
Ananias was keenly aware of God speaking that either means one, his devotion life is good, two, his prayer life is intact, and three, he is prepared when God speaks. But that's a whole different sermon for another day. God speaks to Ananias and he says, Ananias, and Ananias says, Here I am, Lord, in verse 11. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man named Tarsus, or, or a man of Tarsus named Saul. And for behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in, lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is, chosen, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry on my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Now Ananias, as a disciple living in Damascus, receives a message from the Lord in a vision and a message to go to this house where this man from Tarsus named Saul is living and is staying. Most of us would have had this exact response, right? No. We would have been like, uh-uh. I mean, what Fred said earlier, but like, uh-uh. You dialed the wrong number. I think my cell phone's losing. We're breaking up here. It's a dead zone. I know there's a tower right there, but, I, you know, I'm in the basement of the building, my office. We don't, we don't get re reception down there. Uh, no. Now listen to what else he says. I have heard from many that this man seeks to bind and take away all those who are part of the way. So he's heard what's going on, but he doesn't let what he's heard define what he's going to do. You want me to go where and talk to, to who? I know who this man supposedly is. We were warned that he was on his way. He's arrested my friends. He's probably tortured a few of them. He's witnessed the murder, murder of people I care about. I know this. Paul himself Saul later is but known as, as, as Paul. Not a name change here. It's the same person. It's the same thing. Paul himself describes his actions in Acts chapter 26. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus. So these were true things. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme in raging fury against Against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So Paul admits what he did against the church. And God here tells Ananias, Go and lay your hands on this guy. Ananias be like, I'll go lay your hands on this guy. Uh huh. Think about what you would do. Again, look at it through. The perspective of eternity past and eternity future. God is not limited by the depth, the pain, and suffering this man has brought. God is not limited by the atrocities this man has caused. God is in the business of making all things new. This, we said this at Miss George's funeral, and perhaps the most profound thing I learned from spending time with her. This is not an exhaustive book of answers. This is an exhaustive book accounting of God's love for his people and that's it. And we see that here in Acts chapter 9 because this doesn't tell us well why 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 did Saul ever was Saul ever a part of this because it displays for us the depth that God loves his people and the depth that God will go to show love to even a man who was about bringing about suffering and hardship to those whom God loved dearly. We would say, but those were people part of the church. Yeah, they were. And they ended up in a better place. Look at Revelation 6 and 9. And the pain that was brought from it was terrible. But the depth of God's love was not hindered by one man. The depth of God's love was displayed on the account of this man, Saul. It is displayed. We don't get to judge God. We get to understand his love more. When it's hard for us to realize 
we need to remember how lost and deprived and depraved we are ourselves. And yet, in our own death, he adopts us. How often do we take for granted our own salvation and feel as if we have the right to tell those around us that it's about us and we forget that it's not. It's about grace that has been poured out over our own lives. I mean, I was convicted this morning and I've read over this dozens of times. I was convicted this morning. Acting in love towards others, refusing to gossip, follow leaders, praying for growth, inviting unchurched, warmly welcoming those who visit, discovering gifts, equipping others, developing a servant's heart. I mean, sure, probably 40% of the time I'm about this. What about the other 60? We think that we're on some better playing field and we forget we're not. We're no better off. And yet God's grace is being poured out. When we look at the story of Saul, I wonder how many of us are convicted by the fact that we're not praying for those who are the lead persecutors of the faith, those who are most obstinate to the gospel. When we look at Saul, this man brought about much pain, much suffering. How many of us pray for Saul's? Okay, break it down. How many of us pray for those who cause problems in our own life? How many of us pray for those hard to deal with supervisors? How many of us pray for those who gossip against us? Pray for those who cause trouble in our lives? How many of us pray for those children or, or, or in-laws or whatever who are non-believers who cause trouble? How many of us pray for those leaders who we distrust or dislike or we just don't like the way they dress or whatever? They, how many of us spend more time praying for them than we do gossiping or talking about them or distrust? How many of us seek the redemption and love and seek them out in love than we do distrusting? That's the conviction that we should hopefully get. I pray that's where we are this morning because we we should be reminded of Genesis chapter 22 this morning that we are the fulfillment of the nations. That the mere fact that we're sitting in this room is that God is keeping his promise. And he's a good God and a loving God and that none of us deserve it. None of us have earned it. The story plays into the redemptive narrative of this book just like each and every word found in all the passages. Let us be reminded that each of us was redeemed. We're all redeemed to be the instrument, his instrument to take the gospel to the people of whom it takes us to. It's not for our own sake that we are redeemed. We don't earn the badge to sit back and go into retirement, but rather for the furtherance of the glory of our Father and for the sake of the kingdom for which we are citizens, that we are redeemed. And verse 17. So Ananias departed. He entered the house and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, underline the words, Brother Saul. God gives us specific words. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. God is about using his people to spread his name. While Saul was encountered and brought down the road to Damascus by Jesus, God still chose to use Ananias to bring the gospel to him. Not only does Ananias do as God asks, but let us not miss the words that are used here. Saul has been living life in fear for the last three days, no sight, no drinking, no eating. Finally, a man comes to him, and as this man walks up to him, it could have just as easily been someone coming to seek his death. But all of a sudden, there is a touch, and it's not a harsh touch. This man lays hands on him, and he calls him brother. He is part of the family. Calling him brother, both forgiving him and recognizing that they are brothers, sons adopted by the Father who is in heaven. No matter how someone may have, quote, sinned against us, the greater one they sinned against is God. And when redemption has taken place, forgiveness has come, and we are family. We are family. 
We are people of God. No matter where we are. When people in the Middle East suffer at the hands of persecutors, we suffer because we are family. Just as if our children were being hurt. When people at the hands of an unjust regime hurt other believers, we suffer with them because they are our family and we will be with each other for eternity. We pray for them. We love them. We pray for their persecutors, for them to be redeemed and experience the gospel. We are family. We are brothers and sisters. It's not just a biblical word to make us as a church feel all fluffy and gooey inside, but it is an absolute statement. It is an absolute truth. If there's one nation we represent, it's every nation of the world because we are brothers and sisters who will be united for eternity. We will spend every waking moment in eternity with all people saying, brother and sister, and we will love and endure and worship together at the feet of the King of the kings and Lord of lords, and we'll be reunited with those whom we have lost. We'll be reunited with those who are dying at the hands of evil persecutors who need Jesus, and we will love together. And our hope is, is something like this in, in chapter, in verse 18, the scales fell from his eyes. He regained sight and he was baptized. Our hope is, and we pray for this, he takes food, he's strengthened, and he was with the disciples. This is our hope for the persecutors that they see the gospel and they are with us around the throne and they are worshiping and they are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is our hope for our persecutors. This is our hope for Kim Jong-un. This is our hope for Ahmadinejad. This is our hope for the kings and the rulers of this world. This is our hope for the unjust rulers of the world. This is our hope for our president. This is our hope for our congressman. This is the hope for everybody in every nation who is unjust and just in ruling is that, that we are all gathered around the throne one day saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it is not a far-fetched hope because here God has taken the righteous defender of the Jewish people and brought him to be the evangelist of the way. And the one who would go about encouraging and starting churches where hundreds if not hundreds of thousands of people would repent and believe in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we see that from one man who had the right authority to go and arrest and bring back bound to the temple. And we see this man repent and believe and he is at the throne right now saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That is our hope and that is our prayer. That is why we gather on Sundays is to be a people of God, a right people of God. When each of us look at our lives, we may be because, but our hope is that we're not basing this on our own self-righteousness, but we base this on the righteousness of the King of kings, the Lord, that we break our chains, that our, the scales come off of our eyes, and that we recognize that the truth is, is that a God who created also came. He lived here. He left heaven behind so that the great chasm that was caused by the fall, by sin, so that all might be received again, that he might be glorified by the redemption of his people. This is our hope. This is why we gather. This is why we eliminate distractions from worship. This is why we open our doors to anybody who might want to come in. This is why we say, come and be fed and let the Spirit of God feed you. This is our hope. This is our prayer. Paul said in 1 Timothy verse 16, he says, I receive mercy for this reason that in me as a foremost Jesus Christ might display, he might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him. Let that be our anthem. That Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe. I'm sorry, guys, but all of us need the perfect patience of Christ displayed in us because we need the example of Christ in this world because we are all have been lost. And if we are still lost, we need the redemption of Christ. 
If you're not a believer in this room this morning, I encourage you to hear the message of the gospel. Be redeemed and look with great hope towards the kingdom that is here and is coming. If we are believers, let's lay aside the silliness and let's look forward with great hope at the kingdom that is here and is coming. And let's eagerly press forward, eagerly push on. eliminating distractions and praying with great promise for the redemption of the nations, for the redemption of the rulers of this world, for the redemption of those who rub us like sandpaper and let's love them more and love them better because today is the day of salvation. If you don't know Jesus this morning, don't leave this building this morning without speaking with me or with Fred or with Bruce or Richard. And know God. Let's pray together this morning. God, we are grateful for your grace that covers us. God, we pray that you would have patience with us as we struggle continually in sin. But we repent of all of that that we still carry around. God, we pray that your patience would be displayed through us. So that your kingdom might be known more clearly and more abundantly to the world around us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.